Everybody, well, let's dive in. Uh, welcome to uh, part two of the Atlas Real Estate Market Update. And uh, I'm joined here. My name is Tony Julianell. I serve on the leadership team at Atlas, and I'm joined by Ryan Boykin, uh, also on the leadership team and one of the co-founders of Atlas Real Estate. And how this will work this morning is Ryan's going to make a few opening comments, and uh, and then we're just going to open it up for Q and A. And the Q and A. Uh, we'd like to be the lion's share of this event and give you the opportunity to ask anything you'd like to ask around owning rental real estate and how we're approaching the market today. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can just click there, type in your questions, and then uh, I'll read those questions uh, as they come in following the opening comments. So with that, Ryan, take it away. Thanks a lot, Tony. Everybody, I'm Ryan Boykin. Appreciate you joining the call here and uh, learning a little bit about real estate uh, from the Atlas perspective. So um, it's a little bit redundant to the last call, but every time that we join these calls, I'll just remind everybody what Atlas does and what our four business lines are. The first one is, is that we're a property management company. We manage about uh, 3,200 uh, residential units around Denver, Colorado Springs, Phoenix, and Fort Collins. Second one is, is that we are a investment brokerage and a retail brokerage. We help individuals to buy rental properties to save money for the long term, and we help people to purchase their home and sell their home. The third thing that we do is we have a partnership with Zillow Offers and helping them to purchase and sell the homes that they buy through their Zillow Offers program, wherein they buy homes and uh, create new liquidity for the marketplace. And the fourth one is our institutional buying department, wherein we help bigger institutional private equity funds to acquire their portfolios of single family homes for rent. And we do that in Colorado, Phoenix, and Las Vegas. So those are our four business lines. That's a little bit about Atlas Real Estate. Um, one thing that I also kind of wanted to mention on this call is our Atlas investment thesis and explain to those that uh, have not heard this before what our investment thesis is. And I think that this is an interesting commentary, just as we look at the market today and how it's changed through this, this current uh, pandemic and crisis, where does the Atlas thesis still hold true? Where will it be challenged? And uh, what does it mean to us in the future? And I think increasingly as we get more information as to what this market looks like and as to um, how it's really changed, we'll be able to ask more and more of ourselves, is there an opportunity to purchase? And what does that opportunity look like today versus yesterday? How well will that thesis hold in the immediate term? So our investment thesis and the thesis that we try and guide our clients on is really predicated on three things. Uh, the first of those things is that we only purchase homes in markets that we believe are in a 20 year market. So what do I mean by a 20 year market? Uh, for us, the way we define a 20 year market means that the home that we buy today will be worth more money, we believe will be worth more money, it will appreciate over a 20 year period. Now we know that during that 20 year period, and we may be seeing it right now, there's gonna be uh, ups and downs in that picture, but we believe that the fundamental economic environment of the market that we're buying in is strong enough that over the next 20 years, that the property will go up in value. Now, if I ask that question about Denver, and I ask the audience, what level of certainty are we that a home that we buy today will be worth more 20 years from now in, in Denver. And my level of certainty is very high, 90% uh, high. But if you ask me in certain other markets, maybe uh, Wichita, Kansas, uh, Wichita, Kansas may have a, a more fragile base economic structure. And as such, maybe that's a coin flip that the market is going to appreciate over the next 20 years. So Atlas is going to make investments into uh, markets that we believe are strong 20-year markets. And that's really a commentary on long-term appreciation. And the second component of our investment thesis is that we only acquire assets that we believe have significant cash flow, cash flow that can support all of our expenses, all of our debt, and frankly, cash flow that can maintain through those economic downturns so that we can make it to the long term. That's what the cash flow is going to provide. It provides income in the form of passive monthly income, but it also provides us the ability to withstand economic pressure so that we can get there over the long term. And then the third component of the, of the Atlas investment thesis is that we want to buy specific assets that have a nice story around them, that have a nice appreciation or development story around them, such that the market will come to us over the long term and we'll have the opportunity to enjoy above average appreciation. 
So the classic example of this is we may buy in a market that is not in the center of main and main best developments, but we may buy one concentric circle or two concentric circles around that because we believe that the city, the submarket, will grow in that way and we'll get outsized appreciation by targeting those areas. And that really comes down to knowing our marketplace so well that we have submarket knowledge that is unparalleled and uncomparable to that of the other real estate professionals. So that just scopes a little bit more about Atlas uh, Real Estate and our investment thesis and who we are as a company. I do wanna make sure that we leave this open to uh, any kind of question and answer. And I'll pause there in, in one moment um, so that I can open it up to question and answer. I have a lot of other data that I can cover. I have specific market data on the rental activity that we're seeing in the marketplace, as well as purchase and sale activity in the marketplace. Um, but I wanna leave it open for question because I know that there, there are a lot of questions in, in the current environment. And I'll just reiterate that the purpose of these phone calls really is to um, just communicate. We don't have all the answers. We don't pretend to have all the answers, but we're living in this daily from a real estate perspective. It means a lot to everybody financially and their net worth and their long-term savings trajectory. And so this is just a communication exercise. And ideally we can communicate on what we're seeing now. We can communicate on how that is different from what we saw yesterday, but we can take the full package and understand what we're gonna see moving forward in the immediate term. And that's the hardest part. And that's the part that we're going to opine on a little bit, but undoubtedly we'll get that part wrong. So uh, I'll pause there, Tony. Um, shall I continue with some uh, additional info that I put together or would it make sense for me to pause and allow for a couple of questions? Well, let me, let me throw a couple of questions at you that have come through already. And I'll just mm -hmm. remind folks down at the bottom of your screen, you can click on Q and A and type in your questions. And the first one, Ryan, is about everything going on with the stimulus package. And uh, the question is, do we at Atlas really have our arms around the government entitlements being offered to renters and landlords? What's the plan for that? And how are we going to be the experts to, uh, to serve our clients well? Great. Um, this is a giant question. And I don't think that anybody's an expert on answering this question as it relates to the care package quite yet but I do have a few salient points that I think are important. Um, the first one is through the care package, all of the game of how we've done property management and how we've um, tried to deal with difficult situations with our residents is now a little bit different. Um, as an example, one of the items in the care package is that there will be no evictions on any loans that are backed by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or any government entity, VA, FHA, et cetera, for 120 days. So um, if somebody is not paying their rent, we're not going to be able to evict them uh, for that 120 day period. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that they're not responsible for the rent. It doesn't mean that there can't be consequence down the road if they don't pay that rent but it does mean that we have to put a pause on this for 120 days. And actually, let me just highlight that comment, pause. When I look at what the government's doing and I look at what is happening with the care package, what I'm really dissecting and, and what I'm feeling on this is that this is an effort of the government and I think of society at large in many ways to hit the pause button for 90 days. How do we create a 90, 60, 90, 120 day pause reset button so that people can catch their breath and they can continue on with their lives. This is a good case, not best case, but a, a highly good case scenario. If we can hit this pause button for 60 to 90 days and we can recover to where we were and we can get going in the way that we were. And so tools have been created through the care package and otherwise to enable people, both the, the renter who's not able to go to work right now in many cases with shelter in place orders and, and, and otherwise, and they may have lost their job, as well as the owner of that piece of real estate and their ability to pay their bills. And so when you look at the care package, two things have fun, fundamentally been created. One is the renter is going to have time and they're not going to be kicked out of their home because of this uh, pandemic and this economic crisis. And the other is in the equal response, the owner should be created, should, should be allowed to have that same amount of time. And so as an example on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac back loans and all government back loans, there's a foreclosure moratorium for the next 60 days. So as an owner of those uh, pieces of real estate, I, I couldn't be taken to foreclosure and lose my, my real estate. 
Uh, in addition to that, there's an opportunity for that owner of real estate to request up to 360 days of forbearance. And so that means that I could get delayed and deferred mortgage payments for basically a year if I have a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or government-backed loan. Um, in addition to that, there's very lenient credit reporting during this timeline, meaning that if you come to that agreement with the bank, they're not going to ding your credit. So all these things are in support of this notion that we're going to have to hit the pause button here for 60 to 90 days, and then we should be uh, in a stronger position. So that's as, as it relates to tenants and as it relates to owners. And it only really speaks about, and this is the case with the government program, it only speaks to the governmental mortgage product that they can control. So that's Fannie and Freddie, FHA, VA, et cetera. Um, it doesn't speak to your community bank and what the community bank will do in their response. Now, there's one important caveat to that. All community banks respond to uh, bad loans and lack of payment primarily through regulatory concerns. So the government regulates all community and local banks and says, you must have the excellent amount of reserves, you can't have this many delinquencies, and they're very stringent on what that looks like as a result of what happened from 2008 and on in the last collapse that we had. What the government has said through the care package is that they will be lenient in those responses, they'll be forgiving in those responses to give those local banks a similar tool, and that tool would be the opportunity or the ability to defer payments and do forbearance, forbearance packages so that they don't have a regulatory monster on their back saying, hey, come on, you have to do these, you have to foreclose, you have to collect, you have to be tough on those borrowers. So hopefully they're equipping the local banks to be able to respond to this issue as best they can. So I'll pause there. Did I answer the question appropriately, Tony? I can go into SBA loans and that kind of thing, but I think the question really was about the renters and the, uh, the owners as it relates to the care package. Yeah, and um, uh, one of the things that we're doing at Atlas is uh, we just take ser very seriously our responsibility to understand all of this and be able to guide uh, both our residents and uh, our client owners through what their options are. So uh, you'll continue to see information from us about this and updates and uh, resources as uh, the care package becomes uh, more broadly understood. So I think that's fantastic. Ryan, we got another one for you. You ready for this one? Uh, Tony, lay it on me, baby. All right. I have an Airbnb. I'm renting it short term. Should I be switching to a long term tenant right now? Great question. Um, I think absolutely yes. Um, I still said I think, but my, my decision would be yes. Um, what has happened through this? Just take the, the big picture and step back for a moment. Uh, several weeks ago, people were very focused on reward for my dollar. That's a commentary on reward. That's a commentary on upside. And so with Airbnbs, but also with many other investment strategies, it was a, how do I go higher? How do I go stronger? Now, two weeks later, we're in an environment that is, I have to protect, I have to be careful. I have to give myself time and I have to have certainty, okay? Now, both of those can go too deep and too long and too far. And, and humans have a tendency to go too much to the upside and too too much to the downside and let our psychology build these, these stories and that has a, a growing exponential effect. There's something real about this. We are in a protectionary moment right now. So I need certainty and how do I get certainty? Well, one of the great ways to get certainty is to have your, your homes rented for the long term. The Airbnb market is going to be devastated through this. If there's a shelter in place order, frankly, almost across the country at this point, you're seeing shelter in place orders pop up. Uh, Phoenix announced that uh, today, actually at five o'clock, they'll have a shelter in place order here in Colorado's. People aren't gonna be traveling. They're not gonna be staying at Airbnbs. And on top of that, they don't have the disposable income right now to be able to do that because of what's happening with unemployment and, and lack of ability to work. And even if they do have that disposable income, they're probably not thinking about going on a vacation and using it because of the ripple effect of this economically. So absolutely, I would look to move my Airbnb to a long-term rental. Um, uh, we often recommend to our clients that when you're purchasing a property, in any case, you may purchase it and you may decide that you're gonna do an Airbnb. 
But the investment thesis around buying an Airbnb property cannot be the backbone of your investment. That can be something that can be a little bit of icing on the cake, but you still need to be able to come back to the fundamentals of at any time, I can rent this long term and I can still achieve my cash flow needs. I can still achieve that it's in a 20 year market and I'm still putting myself in the best position for a nice path of development appreciation story. And so um, those three things still need to hold. That's the investment of the Atlas investment thesis. It's a very long-term commentary. And so uh, definitely moving the Airbnb to the long-term makes sense right now. But let's also recognize that all these people out there that have Airbnb properties, they're gonna be looking at the same. And all the folks out there that are doing big Airbnb programs, <clears throat> because you've started to see over the last year or so, <clears throat> bigger venture capital backed companies come in and buy entire floors of luxury apartment buildings. And what have they done with them? They've converted them into an Airbnb effectively. They said, hey, this is almost like a hotel play inside a segment of this apartment building. Well, all those groups now are gonna say, that market's dried up, I gotta go long-term on that. And everybody else out there with the standard Airbnb in the house is going to go long term. So we're going to see new supply come to the market in the rental marketplace because all those folks that were short term are going now are going to now become long term. And that's going to have pressure on our ability to rent homes and it's going to have pressure on our ability to maintain our higher rent rates that we've seen over the last few years. We're going to have a rent compression because of new supply that's coming online. That's great. Um, so Ryan, uh, this is a good one. Should I continue collecting rent, but stop paying my mortgage for the time being so that I can build up some reserves? It's a great one. Um, <clears throat> I have a theme that I'm going to touch on over and over again right now. And that is, um, maintaining your cash position and developing strong cash reserves through this period. And what was just asked is a strategy that would enable somebody to maintain higher cash reserves because they're collecting rents on one side and they're not paying their mortgage on the other side. That's a problem, okay? And I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but if you're collecting rents from your property, um, you need to be paying your expenses, particularly your mortgage. And if you're not sure if you can pay your mortgage, it's worth consulting with a professional on this and maybe even calling your bank and explaining to them what's going on. And the reason for that is there's a, there's a law that um, is called, it's about equity skimming. And equity skimming is when you collect rents and you don't pay your mortgage. In your mortgage documents, it states that if you're collecting rents, you must pay your mortgage. Um, and there's all sorts of legalese that goes into that. But if you collect rents and you have revenue and you're not paying your mortgage, that actually is a, um, a crime. It's a it can be a felony. And um, I do not recommend that if you're collecting rents, you're not paying your mortgage. Now, it, may, it is possible that you could be in a circumstance where you're collecting your rents and you're paying all of your expenses, the, the property insurance and the taxes and the maintenance, and there isn't enough money left in the mortgage for the mortgage. Um, in that environment, there's a lot of gray area there. But broadly speaking, if you're collecting rents, pay your mortgage. And if you're not sure if you can do that, this is something to go one-on-one -on -one offline, perhaps with your investment specialist at Atlas, perhaps with your property manager at Atlas, and perhaps with an attorney or, or with a bank or another consultant to understand what your options are. In so many cases in these environments, people think, um, I'm in trouble, I gotta work it out, I'm gonna hide from it, I'm gonna keep this secret and play this little game. In almost every case, lack of communication is going to hurt you in this, in this world. Transparency, open communication, and bad news faster and first is going to help you. It works against human intuition and it works against our ego and our vulnerability to say, oh, I'm screwed, I don't got a dollar to my name. But frankly, work against those issues and get in front of it and communicate and talk to the people that are authorities on this and be vulnerable and say, I'm up a creek. Uh, vulnerability in this will be a strength. That's great. Um, Ryan, uh, this question's related to tenant concessions. So portfolio wide, what percentage of tenants are currently asking for discounts on rent due to unemployment 
And also, as any concession is the owner's decision, uh, what do you recommend to maintain a good relationship with a tenant yet not be taken advantage of as an owner? Great. First thing is maintain the relationship. Um, as a property manager, as an owner of real estate, and I have a resident on the other end, um, sometimes we say tenant, but you know, really the reality is resident is such a stronger word because resident has a connotation of a human that you are in partnership with. If I say that I'm the landlord and you're the tenant, this is what that fundamentally by definition means is that we fight. I'm the landlord, I own you. Tenant, you do what I want. Those are the definitions of those words. Instead, I'm working with you as an owner of a piece of real estate and you're my customer, you're my resident that's purchasing my product, which is the home and the property management. And through purchasing that product, you become my resident. So when I look at it from that perspective, I'm gonna say that I'm gonna maintain the relationship Relationship. I'm going to build the relationship through this time period, and I'm going to ensure that there's trust across that relationship. And that means I'm going to work with that person. Um, how I work with that person is going to vary based on what their specific circumstances, circumstances and what my specific circumstances. Broadly speaking, we're encouraging all of our owners to work with residents as best as they're able to maintain occupancy. In this environment, your number one concern is to maintain occupancy in your rental property. Vacancy is always the biggest cost of owning real estate. And right now, that's, that's tenants in terms of the, the ongoing cost of vacancy if you fall into that category. So I'm gonna make my decisions knowing that I'm gonna maintain occupancy. And I'm gonna maintain collections, even if my collections go down because of a payment plan, because they can't pay the full amount or I don't get anything for a month or two, but it keeps them in the game when they're back on their feet and they're working again. So that's the general strategy that we employ, but we're not administering that, that strategy across the board broadly because we understand that there's specific circumstances for both the owner and the resident that we need to take into consideration as we, as we provide recommendations. So that's the, the broad commentary and the spe specific commentary in terms of what data we've seen so far we manage about 3,200 units across um, Phoenix, Denver, Colorado Springs, and Fort Collins. And currently we've got notification from less than 100, about uh, 75 or 80 folks that have said, hey, I've been impacted by this and I'm having a tough time. Now I'm sure that number is a lot less than the actual number. Those are the people that were courageous enough to share with us. Uh, we're making a lot of outbound calls to our residents right now to check in with them and see how they're doing and give them the opportunity to share with us what's going on with them. Because we know that if we initiate that conversation, it's more likely that they'll be open to us and be vulnerable with us and telling us if they're having a tough time. Even though we've had a lot of outbound calls, we still had less than 80 people notify us. I anticipate in the coming week, we're gonna see a lot more and we'll see a lot of people that just won't pay the rent in April. So it's a little bit premature to give data on that because 80 as a percentage of 3,200 doesn't really show. Oh, by the way, of those 80, it's not saying that none of them can pay. It's saying, hey, I'm gonna be impacted on this and I need to have a conversation. Many of those have also said, I can pay something for this month or I can pay half of this month, um, but I just want you to know I'm gonna be struggling if this thing continues. That's great. So um, just a reminder, you can uh, enter your questions, just type them in, click that Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, and um, you can type in a question there, and uh, we'll do our best to get to it and uh, see if we've got a uh, uh, spot on answer. Uh, so Ryan, do you think we're going to see more buying opportunities in commercial or residential in the weeks ahead? Um, I think that we'll see more buying opportunities in commercial, not in the weeks ahead, but in the months ahead. Um, if I had to compare the two, I would give the lead to commercial. And the reason for that is the commercial market is going to have a little bit more of a, a double whammy. Uh, the residential market is very much based on government lending and the care package and the government is saying government lending is going to really work with you. Okay, so that's the biggest tier of the residential lending marketplace. The commercial lending marketplace also has a lot of government lending, but also has um, uh, much more local banks and community banks as the life insurance companies, as the collateralized mortgage-backed securities world, which is sort of a world unto itself, and I won't go into the details there. And then, of course, it has the Fannie and Freddie as well, but it's a little bit more of a diverse pool. 
In addition to that, um, <clears throat> so that more diverse pool has less tools at their disposal potentially than the, the consolidated Fannie Freddie world on the residential side. Um, <clears throat> that's a very big comment and there's a lot of detail there, but that's my initial read. That's the lending environment. So the commercial side is gonna have a little bit more pressure on it potentially because those banks and lending institutions may feel a more immediate need to, to be um, active in, in trying to garner what is owed to them. The second thing, and I think the thing more important on this is that you have a direct consequence in the commercial environment with um, uh, the restaurants that are being shut down, the offices that are sitting vacant right now because nobody's in there even working in the offices, all the different categories of, of the commercial world that are having very, very direct consequence. And I think that those direct consequences will lead to uh, commerce and business that isn't able to survive during this time period. And when that happens, you have people that can't pay rent, not just now, but at all. And then you have the ripple effect that percolates through to the, to the commercial real estate side. Um, I think that will happen to some degree with the residential side as well. But um, to me right now, it feels a little bit bigger on the commercial side and, uh, and time will tell. So Ryan, the follow-up on that is it seems like home prices right now are still really strong in Denver and um, likely in Phoenix as well. Is it a good time for me to unload some assets and sit on cash and look at buying something six months from now or even potentially uh, buying into a stock market that looks like it's on sale? Um, so the, the notion of selling a property right now, it may make sense to try and test the market and sell a property. The market looks to be strong, uh, particularly for homes that are priced less than 500,000 or maybe even $600,000 in Denver, and then tiered down to Phoenix and Colorado Springs being a little bit lower than that price point. Um, <clears throat> I think you have a tricky decision to make if you're looking to sell a home. Generally speaking, if you have a single family home or even a duplex or a fourplex, <clears throat> if you're going to sell that home, you're going to need to first vacate that tenant from the home. And then you're gonna to have to do fix up to it so that it looks like a nice home for somebody to buy as a first or second time home buyer. So you may be able to sell your home. You may be able to get a good price. It looks as though pricing is holding up right now, although we're way too early to tell that that's going to hold up. That's just the first week or two of indication on this. But let's say that it did hold up. So what are you doing by, by going through that exercise? You're taking risk because you just went from an occupied uh, home with a resident in it. You asked that resident to vacate. Now you have vacancy, plus you're gonna have to spend some money getting that home fixed up so that it's ready to sell. And then you have to put it on the market for a month, two months, three months until the transaction's all the way done. So that total time picture may be three or four months. And what happens if the market actually does compress and we don't get out of this problem quickly in the next three or four months? Then I'm left with a home that is worth, instead of 500, it's probably worth 450 or 400, and I don't have a resident in it. And because I don't have a resident in it, there's new supply on the market, harder to get that resident, more time vacancy, and less in final rents. And so I think you're taking a little bit of a, uh, a risk trying to sell a home right now if you have an occupied piece of real estate. I like the certainty of knowing that I'm going to have income right now and that it's going to bolster my cash position so that the assets that I have maintain healthy because I have that cash and I'm not depleting them on trying to get a reward picture. Um, that's probably the way I, I pursue that question. I might also say that if I could sell a home that was tenant occupied with the tenant still in place right now, and I have a few assets I'm considering this with, where it actually makes sense to try and sell it with the tenant in the home because it's a unique asset that uh, allows for it, <clears throat> then I may say, okay, I'm gonna test the market with this. Um, but I'm still taking some risk on that because I might make my tenant feel jittery and they may wanna lean out, uh, leave the home and, and uh, leave the lease to a new property. Um, and I still may have to do some fix up and I may put it under contract and then the contract falls out. So you're taking a little risk there. But I just like this one. So this says, uh, thank you all for putting these on as an owner. We appreciate Atlas. So uh, thank you for that comment. We, uh, we appreciate the heck out of you too. Uh, Ryan, across your management portfolio, is there an asset class you're receiving a higher number of indicators that there will be rent delinquencies? 
Uh, the highest would be restaurants and gyms and wellness studios. Um, every single restaurant, gym, brewery, wellness studio, um, all of that category that I have in, in my personal portfolio has already reached out to me and said, we have a problem, please work with us. And I had great conversations with a lot of them yesterday talking about what we would do to work with them. And I feel confident that most of them are gonna still be in the game when this thing resets. Uh, a couple of them, unfortunately, this may be the end of the business. So that one's tricky. That asset class is definitely very impacted. I think that after that, I probably slot in the office category because what's happening here is we're probably doing a few things to change the pattern, change the habit of how we consume real estate. So think about real estate consumption. On the office category, we say we get up in the morning, we go to the office, we work all day, and we come home. Well, we're all being trained over this time period, shelter in place, that actually I can get up in the morning, wash my face and brush my teeth and eat a little something, and I can conduct all my business right here in front of this video screen on this video conference call. So will there be businesses that come out of this and say, you know what, actually, we had 10,000 square feet of office. We only need 3,000 feet because it was really effective. In fact, perhaps even more effective to have more of our people work at home. And so there's a, a different demand for flexibility on that. I think in general, all commercial real estate is going to take a huge swing towards flexibility. Um, some of you may know that I've recently started up a venture called Reactive. And Reactive is all about um, creating new flexibility in commercial real estate markets both with vacant real estate as well as occupied real estate that isn't fully utilized. So I think that there'll be a big trend in that category with office as well. Um, I think that it's too early to say what's gonna happen with residential real estate and the residential markets in terms of what's gonna be hit most and where the opportunity may be. Do that. Do you think the situation will get more people to buy instead of rent in the future? Keeping in mind that renting has become uh, a lifestyle choice for a lot of people rather than uh, a way of uh, living somewhere because you're unable to purchase. Uh, are people going to look at this and say, wow, it seems like there's more relief for a homeowner uh, in a time like this than there is for a renter. Maybe I should own a home instead. Um, I don't think that I've seen anything yet that would uh, compel me to believe that this issue is going to push somebody more towards owning or more towards renting. Uh, there probably are some arguments there, but I don't think I've seen anything that's compelling enough to, uh, to change that dichotomy quite yet. Um, it, you could probably make the argument that it's a little bit more on the favorable side of owning um, because people are looking for certainty right now and owning a property may lean toward, lead towards certainty. Um, I think that what's tough about that is that um, this really shows the fragility of our economy right now. Uh, one of the most stark uh, realizations that I've had is that our society really doesn't have any savings and reserves. Um, we're talking about one month of rent or mortgage payment and people are saying, I don't have one month of reserves on the sideline. And we preach all the time at Atlas, have a rainy day fund. fund have $5,000 or $10,000 set aside for the three months of vacancy you might have. Well, that applies to my personal life as well. It's nice if I have six months of reserves for my living expenses. We just don't have reserves as a society. We, we're, we're not a great saving society. We saw savings tick up through the last downturn from uh, the 2010 to 13, 14 timeline. Savings grew a little bit, but it grew just a little bit. And um, I think that we're still in that environment where we don't have very many savings. And in absent savings, you can't buy a home very easily. You can do it, but you can't do it very easily. So that would be the counter is that people are still going to be renting because we're in a, a fragile cash reserve savings stability standpoint where renting is going to be your more like the outcome. Uh, Ryan, what are your thoughts on the difficulty of leasing vacant units currently? through maybe the next 120 days in the front range? Well, the first thing is, is that we are leasing units right now. I'm, I'm pleased with the rental activity that our property management team has seen and our ability to rent units right now. But consider first that there's some inherent difficulties with renting a home. I think that one of the things that we really bring to the table when somebody wants to come rent a home from us is we're a very professional company. 
and we exude this this relationship development this um hey we're here with you in this journey of renting a home well how do we exude that most of it is through personal interaction meeting somebody and being a, a smile in their journey and answering questions and sharing the features of a home a lot of that tool is taken away from us right now because it's shelter in place and people aren't supposed to be interacting face to face and so there's remote showings that are happen, happening now we can still rent a property in that environment but it's going to look a little different it's a little bit more difficult to um to get those uh homes leased and so uh, there are some just logistical issues associated with renting a home that, that make it a little bit tougher. Um, but I do think that the next 120 days is going to show higher vacancy and longer times to, uh, to rent homes. I also think that one of our primary strategies that we've always leaned upon is that when somebody gives us notice that they're going to be leaving their lease at the end of their lease, we're always proactive in telling them, okay, great, it says in our lease that we can 30 days or 60 days prior to the end of your lease term, we can start to show that home to new people that are interested in renting it. And so we're, we're setting up showings while the home is occupied. And the reason why we do that, of course, is because ideally, if somebody's going to move out on uh, March um, uh, 31st, we have somebody that's already signed a lease for April 1st or April 5th, I mean, right off the bat, so that we only have a few days of vacancy. Well, that's almost gone as a tool for us because uh, we're not in an environment where we can ask somebody that's living in a home to have a visitor from the outside world that has a whole different set of people that they've been in contact with to come into the home. And, and of course, that would be um, pandemic spreading or, or COVID spreading. So a lot of tools are missing from our tool shed, uh, but I do still think that there's demand. And I think that the cure to this demand right now oftentimes is going to be that if you're if you have room to negotiate on price it's going to be a, a big component to making sure that you don't have higher vacancy and we'll probably advocate for that because we think there's so much value in the certainty of occupancy right now <clears throat> did i answer the question tony yes uh that was great um ryan do you think single family properties are better positioned than multifamily long term as renters may experience a culture shift and desire more distance from neighbors, not sharing common areas, et cetera? Um, that's interesting. Um, I think long-term, we're not gonna have that concern. I think people might have that concern in the short term, but frankly, we have very short memories and um, long-term people are gonna say, I, I wanna rent in an apartment and it's got the amenities or the, the pricing that I require or desire. Um, there could be a slight push towards single family and the distancing component that comes with that. But there's a lot of people that don't want to live in a single family home because of the maintenance required and the headache associated with some of those components in a yard and shoveling. And so a lot of that comes down to desire and price and affordability and amenities. I think over the long term that won't shift meaningfully, um, but in the short term it probably will. Uh, one of the reasons why I love investing in single family real estate that has nothing to do with this pandemic is that single family real estate gives me multiple exit options that multifamily real estate does not. So when I go to buy a home, uh, first I'm, I'm buying a home and I can see what the value of it is. Then I'm gonna put a renter in it and have my cash flow. And 10 years from now, if I decide that I wanna sell that, that investment, I could sell it as an investment to another Ryan Boykin and leave my tenant in place. Or I could say, geez, the investment market is bad for this home, but the home is appreciated meaningfully and there's just a home buyer out there that wants to come and buy this home. And maybe my takeout buyer is going to be a home buyer instead of an investor. I don't have a home buyer class for the apartment investment. As an apartment building, I'm an investor selling to an investor. So the next investor is looking for a return on investment, and that's the way he's going to analyze the deal. The home buyer I might sell to doesn't care about the return on investment so much. They want a, a two car garage and a nice yard. So. I think there's a, a good case for why single family real estate is particularly interesting as an asset class. Um, but I don't think it has a lot to do with the, uh, the COVID crisis right now. Um, Ryan, uh, are you willing to make a best guess for delinquency in April and May across the portfolio? I'm going to say no, I'm not willing to make a best guess. Um, I will say that I stress tested my portfolio and I'll share with the audience what I did to stress test my portfolio. Broadly speaking, I said that for the month of April, my commercial tenants would pay me $0 in rent. 
Now, that's broadly speaking, because my industrial tenants, I, I analyzed every one of them, and almost all of my industrial tenants will pay their rents. I feel pretty confident about that. But a lot of my, um, I already talked about my restaurant wellness gym tenants. I even think that some of my office tenants are going to be pretty shaky on paying it. So I kind of just said, hey, I'm going to be real conservative and almost put a zero on that. Then I said in May, we're gonna to start to see a little bit more in rents on my commercial side. And I said, maybe that could be a 50% of my total world, including all the resident, excuse me, all the commercial restaurants and industrial and all that, maybe it comes up to a 50% payment. And then it slowly steps up from there. Um, on the residential side, I, I sort of just stress tested it and said, maybe in April, I'm only getting 80% payment. Um, excuse me, I think I said 75% for April, ticking up to 80% in May. Uh, and maybe up from there a little bit, um, but kind of 80% over the next few months. Um, I think that's a pretty conservative test case. Um, unemployment is skyrocketing, but I think the last number I saw was 13%. So I'm basically saying 20% um, unemployment, you know, vacancy in my residential portfolio. Uh, I think it'll hold water, but, um, but we'll see. That's what I did to stress test. And it was a good exercise for me to say, okay, if that happened to my entire portfolio, how's my global cash position? Am I, do I have enough cash right now to withstand that issue if it went on for six months? If it went on for 12 months? Um, my initial look was for six months and I felt very confident about where we would sit. Um, but I'll do it again here shortly when I have more data and over a longer period of time to determine is 12 months how long I think this will go. And if I don't have enough cash right now, what are my cash strategies to bring on new liquidity to my world so that I can withstand that time? That's great. Uh, Ryan, any uh, lease renewal strategies, like maybe asking for an 18 month plus lease and an expedited renewal? Absolutely. Um, asking for a longer lease term is a great one. Uh, discussing what's important to that resident and really understanding how can we check some of their boxes. And maybe there were boxes in the past that we weren't as concerned with, but there could be some really easy ones. They might say, geez, man, I know that um, you've said all along that you're not going to build a, a, a door to the fence for my in and out with the kiddos and bikes. But I, if you did that, that would really mean a lot right now. Great. That's a $500 item. Let's go. Um, I think strategies around that and being a little bit more accommodating, things that we didn't necessarily need to do, but we're going to really focus on what the desire is from the resident to keep them in. We talked about longer lease term. We talked about in the last conversation what pricing looks like. And I'm going to be aggressive in understanding that that renter may say, hey, look, I've been paying you 1800 bucks. I can't afford 1800 bucks. What I can afford is 1700 or 1600. I'm gonna take a real consideration on that because I know that if they leave my property, I, I'm gonna be vacant for at least a month. And that one month of vacancy costs me $1,800 and take $1,800 over 12 months. Um, what is that 150 bucks a month? That's lost revenue. So I'm really gonna be more accommodating in that approach. Uh, you mentioned Phoenix, Vegas, and Denver. Are you monitoring all those markets right now? And what are you seeing in those markets as you monitor them? Yes, we're monitoring all those markets. Um, and uh, what we're seeing, broadly speaking, is that the markets all look healthy for home purchase and home sale. Um, now, remember, all this data is really backward looking. Uh, as an example, all those markets, um, the original list price to the closing value that ratio, so it was originally listed at $500,000 and it actually closed at $400,000. That would be an 80% original list to closed price. Uh, well, we're not even close to that. We're at 99% in Denver and 98.5% in Phoenix. I mean, the data is very, very strong. The area that I am concerned with is the number of new listings per week in those markets. And so far, we're still seeing new listings come online that look, look palatable. And that means that sellers are saying, I still wanna go out there and sell my home and I wanna test the market. The other data point that I think is interesting is the amount of showings and showing activity in those markets. And you know, I'm not sure how to read this yet. The showing activity looked like this, and then the last week it did this, straight down. Well, why did it go straight down? We have a shelter in place order. Um, people don't feel comfortable going out and doing those showings. And so um, part of that is the shelter in place order. Part of that is 
maybe a, a lack in a lack of demand. Um, and then part of it may be people are saying, hey, I don't need to see the home because I can see it online virtually and I'm doing the virtual tour and, and those different components where I feel confident enough to maybe make that offer without even having seen it because I'll see it at inspection. So there's a story there that I think is a little bit hard to follow, but I think that um, the initial commentary is the market seems to be strong still, but I don't trust it because of the, uh, the leading indicators. Um, and I think that we're gonna see um, some negative market data in the coming weeks or a few months here uh, as a result of what I'm, I'm just beginning to see. Um, anecdotally, I'll tell you that our investment specialists and our brokers internally at Atlas are having a lot of success still putting properties under contract and still selling properties. I've been pretty pleased with the amount of volume that uh, has come through the channels and um, uh, that's really positive. Brian, um, what do you think the realtor profession looks like after this pandemic? How does it change? I think it looks a lot like it does after every real estate or economic difficulty. You're going to have um, a retrenching of the people that really have a well-defined business model and a well-defined niche. Uh, those people are going to have success. And the people that say, yeah, I'm all things to all people are going to have a lot harder time. And I think that a lot of the real estate community that doesn't have stable income through their productivity is going to be pushed out because they're not going to be able to pay their bills and they're going to need to get to a stable environment. Um, you know, I think the average realtor um, does three transactions a year of real estate, which is amazing. And I compare that to our investment specialists and our brokers that are doing, you know, on average three a month. And so we're 12 X the average. That, that's just a commentary on, on knowing your business and being an absolute expert and having knowledge and being committed to your craft. And so I think that we'll have a, um, a loosening in, um, well, loosening is the wrong word. I think we'll have fewer people in the marketplace that are real estate professionals. Um. Ryan, uh, I'm going to ask, ask you one last question. And uh, this one, um, what are the things that you're doing personally these days to stay centered? Uh, um, you know, the first thing that I'll say on that is that um, our society teaches us to be hyper-focused on the moment, on the right now and the immediacy of, I heard this and it made me feel this way. And um, I think taking a step back from that and understanding that there's a broad picture at play, that we're going to survive this moment, that um, the sun still sets in the west and rises in the east, and that there's a, uh, a bigger picture of all this uh, is, is probably the starting point. Um, I'm certain that we'll make it through this time. And I'm certain that humanity will come up with solutions to the problems of how we're going to deal with this. I really believe in our ability as, as a race to identify and solve acute problems. And this is an acute problem. This is an immediate problem. So I have a lot of confidence in that. Um, I personally have a big meditation practice and, um, that's been really helpful in understanding what that looks like, uh, for me on a daily basis. I've had some very stressful days over the last week and I've had some really challenging days from an emotional, a heart, a sorrow, a pain standpoint, and, um, having those, those reservoirs to tune into of the long and the broad picture, as well as the, uh, the spiritual guidance of, um, the meditation component. Um, and I think that I am very fortunate, and this is a tough one, is that I still feel very in tune with my community. Uh, that starts with my wife and my child. Uh, we have a very robust relationship and we're really investing into each other. And I think that that actually provides the reservoir of energy that is required to figure out all these tough decisions that we're making. And so I'm really investing into that. So those are some of the things that I'm doing. I could probably talk about that one for an hour as well. I love that topic. Um, I'm a very, very big believer 
in the value of stress. I embrace stress. I think that stress 80 or 90% of the time is something that makes us so much stronger as humans, as individuals, as communities. Um, every now and then the stress gets so high that you risk a, um, a response that is systemic collapse. And um, I'm not there personally, I'm very far from that in terms of the stress being so high that I would collapse my environment, my world would fall apart. But I think that this exercise of if my stress is getting so high, what mechanism can I go to to release some of that stress is really important. Because if you get to the systemic collapse standpoint, it really is a problem. It really is very, very detrimental. Um, and the rest of the time, understand that the stress is probably doing a lot of good for you. That's great, Ryan. Um, hey, John. Yeah. yeah. I have one other thing about real estate that I want to just mention. Great. Uh, we talked about hoarding cash and creating cash reserves. Um, there's several ways to do that in terms of how you spend your money. I just want to mention right now that society at large is giving us an opportunity to save money by deferring payments. So that might be working with your bank to defer the mortgage payment. That may be determining that you're not going to pay your property taxes right now. City of Denver said they're not going to charge interest to people that aren't paying the property taxes right now. You may be, be able to defer insurance payments. You certainly should be deferring maintenance costs if they're non-necessary and capital expenditure, big capital um, construction costs if they're non-necessary. All those things will help you uh, build your cash reserve. You should definitely on a personal level be uh, saving money on non-essential uh, expenses, uh, canceling the subscriptions you don't use and things like that. That's a big deal if you're worried about your cash position. Those are all uh, uh, cash saving items. Against that, you also have the ability to look at leverage as a way to create new liquidity. So you may consider getting a line of credit because a line of credit provides you with the opportunity to have access to equity that is latent, that is lazy equity. So I would really consider talking to your bank right now and seeing if you could get a line of credit. I'm not saying to then use your line of credit. You have to think about whether or not you use it, but consider at least getting it. I am considering doing cash out refinances of properties that have a lot of equity in them because it gives me a reserve of capital that I can pull from. And that equity that I do as a cash out refinance may be equity that I use to then go deploy and buy a new property if the market shows me that there's a discount on property. So I am, consider, I am considering refinancing my property instead of selling my property right now, knowing that if I pull out some of that equity and it turns out there's no buy opportunity, what do I do with that equity? I just pay it right back. And what did it cost me to do so? Well, I had to pay a little origination. I had to pay a little bit of an appraisal and some closing fees. But the cost of that is worth it because it garnered me certainty and it garnered me more opportunity so that I could go buy the next opportunity if it presented itself. So um, that's a real commentary on cash. I'm still in a position that this whole thing is too early to say what's going to happen in the future. The dust will settle. We'll have plenty of time to see what's going on and then make decisions. But right now, when the, the lending markets are still available, I may consider that to some degree. So that was the last thing I wanted to mention on real estate since we didn't hear the question on it. And uh, Tony, all I do is talk and talk and talk. Yeah, you must be sick of hearing my voice. Uh, uh, no comment. And um, that was fantastic. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating. We have some great questions. Uh, it is our intention to continue to do uh, these webinars on a regular basis. Uh, likely weekly for a while here and uh, also as needed when we uh, when we see uh, really pertinent information. So uh, and we will be sending out some more resources to uh, all of our owners uh, that we manage for around that comment Ryan just made. So what are the payments that can be deferred now and how to think about that uh, as well as generating liquidity. So watch for that and we'll also be sharing insight as we gain that insight on the CARE Act, CARES Act uh, that was signed into law. Uh, keep in mind that's a, uh, I think it was uh, right under 900 pages. Ryan, uh, I read 450 and Ryan took 445. It didn't seem fair, but um, <laughs> as everyone's kind of parsing through that, uh, that new bill and figuring out how all of that works, we will be sharing uh, the summaries that we see and the details from that that will be helpful. Uh, for the people that uh, that we serve. So thanks for joining us again today. This, uh, this webinar recording will be made available. So if you want to share that with others, we'll make sure that we send it out to you and watch for our next invite for next week.
Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.